Good morning and welcome to the Centre for Aging Better's webinar, The Road to Recovery. We're really pleased to have so many people joining us for this discussion. Uh, we had over 600 people signed up, so obviously very uh, topical and no doubt a draw with our popular panellists who I'll introduce in a moment. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Anna Dixon, Chief Executive of the Centre for Aging Better. Joining me this morning are Andy Burnham, the Mayor of Greater Manchester, and Torsten Bell, Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes for you. We asked for questions in advance of the webinar and we had over 70 people submit questions. So I'm afraid we won't be getting to all of them. I don't think even if we had a whole day, we would get through them. Uh, but I will be asking our panelists a selection of questions today. And I'm sure that you will have more questions and comments as we go along and I invite you to send those questions through the Q&A button. Uh, you should be able to see this in the ribbon at the bottom of your screen. You can also participate in the chat and Aging Better staff will be on hand to answer your questions and signpost you to relevant information. So today's webinar is also being live streamed on YouTube and it will be recorded and available to watch and share on our YouTube channel. You can also join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag road to recovery. So before we hear from Andy and Torsten, I'd like to take a few minutes to set the context for today's webinar and some of the themes we will be covering in the series of the Road to Recovery webinars. So the COVID-19 pandemic is a global public health crisis and one with huge social and economic consequences. It's brought the world to a standstill and in the UK it's laid bare huge health and financial inequalities. For many uh, who are still in the eye of the storm, such as those working on the front line in care and the NHS, food producers and retailers working round the clock to put food on the shelves and those businesses that remain closed, recovery may seem a long way off. So while governments are still grappling with the immediate impacts, it's vital we begin to look ahead to that long road to recovery. So in this webinar series, we want to look at the steps we need to take, not to return to business as usual, but to emerge stronger than before. To use a phrase that Andy and other local leaders have coined, we must build back better. So why is this a question for those of us interested in ageing? Well, the pandemic has hit us at a time when our population is older than it's ever been before. Uh, to give you some sense of this, back in 2000, there were 9.3 million people over 65 in the UK. Last year, the figure stood at 12 million. Fast forward 10 years and we can expect 18 million people to be over 65. This age shift should not have been a surprise. The 1960s baby boomers have been with us a while and are now entering their 60s. And yet somehow we've uh, had our heads buried in the sand. We're somehow guilty of failing to really understand what this age shift means for society, for our communities and for us. So in my new book, uh, a little plug here, um, out this week, The Age of Aging Better, A Manifesto for Our Future, I set out the actions we need to take as a society to secure a better future. And I challenge some of the naysayers and doom mongers who spread fear about a tsunami of older people or a pension time bomb or the burden of older people on the NHS. I think, and as I set out in the book, it's time for us to look more positively at the future and to look for positive solutions about how we can help make ageing better. From where I'm standing, I can see two possible futures. If I look in one direction, I can see a dystopia, the age of ageing badly. This is the future we get if we don't take action. High unemployment rates, social care system has collapsed, Communities are unsafe, people of different generations rarely mixing, poor quality housing means people are living in homes that are in disrepair, and inequalities in life expectancy are widening with more people living longer in poor health and with disability. I can also see another future, the age of ageing better, 
more people are working for longer, pensioner poverty has been consigned to history. Investment in public transport and age-friendly communities mean town centres and high streets are thriving with people of all ages coming together. People are living in well-insulated, accessible homes and government action on prevention means more people are living longer in good health. This age of ageing better doesn't have to be a dream. If we take our heads out of the sand, we can take action needed to create it. The truth is that humans are incredibly adaptable and we've seen in response to the COVID crisis how the whole world en masse seems to have taken probably the biggest and fastest social and legal transformation in history. So we can do this and we certainly should use this crisis to take action. So over the course of the webinar, and I hope we'll pick up some of the themes today, we need to be looking at changes to our homes, our workplaces, our communities, and to our health and social care system. COVID-19 has shone light on the best and worst examples. We've seen communities coming together to help one another, employers implementing radical flexible working and support for those with caring responsibilities. But we've also seen the human cost of being imprisoned in an unsafe home and the shocking inequalities in health with those who are poor and from BM BAME communities hardest hit by the virus. So the pandemic has lifted a curtain on many issues that have been out of sight and out of mind for many years. So I would argue now is the time to do something about it as we set out on the road to recovery. And I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Burnham, Mayor of Greater Manchester and Torsten Bell, the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation, who are gonna be sharing their thoughts with us about how we set out on the road to recovery. But before I go to Andy, I'd just like to invite you to give us your views and ask you a question. It will appear on the screen in a moment. And this is where I hope that the technical team will be able to hit a button and the polling question appear. Here it is. Do local areas have the resources for recovery? Yes, no, not sure. Please vote now. So this is where we need the little timer in the background, giving you the calendar countdown. So hopefully everybody's had a chance to vote and we can see the results. So many of you, almost half, don't think that area, local areas have got the resources for recovery. Only one in five of you think they do. Thanks very much if we can close that. And if Andy can unmute, I'd now like to invite Andy to give us his perspective on how we turn the current crisis into an opportunity to reshape society. So over to you, Andy. Thanks very much indeed, Anna. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for joining us. And can I start actually by thanking you, Anna, uh, and the Centre for Aging Better for putting this on, uh, this event today. It's the right conversation for us all to be having. Uh, and also for all the support that you've given uh, to Greater Manchester. We're proud to be the UK's only age-friendly city region as designated by the World Health Organization. And we are not complacent. We work hard to keep earning that, uh, that crown uh, and your support's been huge uh, in all of that. Uh, and I should just say to everybody watching the, the price for, for this event today is clearly by the book. So uh, I think we, we all got that message, Anna, Thank, and we will, and we'll look forward to it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, be slightly risky and give you a sort of a, a structure for my comments so that you can kind of get where I'm coming from. I'm going to give three points of quite hard hitting analysis on what we've learned from this crisis, three positives that have emerged from it, and then three things that Greater Manchester uh, might do to, to turn it into a positive, as, as Anna said. So let me start with the hard hitting analysis. I think the first uh, obvious conclusion that you can draw looking at how this has developed is that we've lost sight on health inequalities in this country. And as a result, this virus has hit the poorest communities hardest. Um, 10 years ago, I was health secretary, you may remember. Um, the Labour government was too late in some ways in coming to, to health inequalities. It commissioned Professor Sir Michael Marmot uh, quite late on, but he did a hugely um, uh, groundbreaking report uh, for us. Um, which laid out what needed to happen in terms of 
improving people's work, improving people's housing, uh, improving educational opportunities, investing in the early years. And I'm afraid it's not a political point to say that didn't happen. Not only did it didn't happen, we did the opposite in the decade between 2010 to 2020. And uh, Sir Michael said that himself when he did his follow up report earlier uh, this year. So let's just think about how that impacts on uh, older uh, people. The figures I've got are that if you if you ask people whether they have good, fair or bad health, 34% of people who, who are white English would say they, they have fair or bad health. That rises to 63 to 69% uh, amongst um, the Asian uh, community, but is 86% amongst the Bangladeshi community. And we know that the Bangladeshi community was identified as the, the hardest hit uh, by, by COVID, uh, by Public Health England uh, last week. This pandemic has brutally exposed uh, the health inequalities in, in our country and something drastic needs to be done about that. The second point of analysis is clearly on social care. Um, and it's obvious, I think now to anybody watching what's happened, that it was in no position to face what's been thrown at it over the last uh, three or four months. Uh, and that is the failure of all political parties, actually, including my own. Uh, none has taken seriously social care reform or funding uh, over the last uh, 30 years. Everyone has ducked it. And I'm afraid, you know, the whole country can now see what's wrong with social care. The inequality between hospitals and care homes is, is clear. And I think this is uh, good in some ways in that social care is often kind of in the margins because most people in their ordinary lives aren't interacting with it. And it's only when you kind of see it and experience it that you see how bad it is. Well, finally, the whole country can see that social care is in no position to face this. One statistic stands out for me. Unison in the Northwest polled care workers here and asked them um, if they felt they needed to self-isolate, would they uh, be able to be paid? And 80% feared that they wouldn't uh, get paid if they had to self-isolate. So that tells you, doesn't it, that this is a social care system that doesn't allow the people who work within it to protect their own health, and then by extension can't protect the health of the people they care for, utterly broken. Third point of analysis is basically in terms of how the government has tried to run its response to the, to the pandemic. And bear in mind, I've been kind of uh, constructive in my response, hopefully, to say, look, I, I, you know, I, I dealt with swine flu, but it was nothing like this. And I, I do have a lot of sympathy with the challenge that they've, that they've had to deal with. However, what we've seen, I'm afraid, is a sort of a default setting of government kick in again, not, not a devolved approach, but a highly centralised I'm afraid, London-centric approach to running this, uh, this response. Um, and it, it has made it very difficult um, from our perspective uh, to influence decisions. Often they're passed down to us with no consultation whatsoever. And that's a problem because it's the opposite of what we need going forward. Leveling up doesn't just have to come back, it has to come back with a vengeance because we've been hit hardest by the health crisis uh, in the North because we've got more deprived communities in other parts of the country. And we're about to be hit even harder by the economic crisis that will follow. And you know, we can't respond to that in the same way. Change is needed. And myself and the mayor of the Liverpool city region made that argument yesterday. Let me just go on quickly to the three positives that have emerged from this before I come to the, the conclusions. The first is we've taken a big leap into the digital world. A uh, huge leap, actually. So much more is happening digitally primary care being delivered uh, digitally. We're, we're providing mental health support to all age groups uh, via online means. We finally move forward in this crisis to create a, an integrated health and care record for all 2.8 million people in Greater Manchester. It was kind of, wasn't moving forward quickly enough. And finally, this crisis has really pushed that forward. We've introduced um, new digital monitoring systems across our social care system. So that's a big opportunity, but, but, but there's a risk here, isn't it? It can also accentuate a divide, particularly between older uh, people and, and uh, other generations. So big leap into the digital world, but one, one to watch. Second uh, big positive, uh, one of my council chief executives this week was just saying to me, the, the new, new way of delivering services has taken a huge leap. The community hubs that have been set up has actually exposed a lot more about how public services can work differently, working with the voluntary sector, and even a suggestion that we should keep them uh, going forward because you know, they are actually 
they're reaching people who don't often get reached by uh, normal means of delivery. So that's a, a real positive. The third positive, people are more active. You can see it when you're out and about, more people are taking walks of all ages. Um, there's more community mobilization. That's a real positive. We've got to try and keep that as well. So what does this mean then? Uh, I'll finish up with just three suggestions, Anna, as to what, what that means for us in Greater Manchester. The first is I think we've got to become much more serious about digital connectivity for everybody. More and more of, of life and the conversation is taking place online. And yes, some older people are, have managed to get in that world, but a lot haven't. So talk of digital skills for older people can't just be a kind of thing that lives on the fringes that we might get round to at some point. It has to be a structured program now where we ensure that everyone is able to connect digitally and be part of the conversation. So I'm going to be looking at the adult education budget and other support that I've, I've got to be able to make, make this a right for people to be, to be digitally connected um, and that we have high quality um, full fibre in all communities, not just the more well-off communities, but it's, a, it's 100%. And that's something that I think needs to come, come from this. The second thing is capturing this change in public service uh, delivery. We're proud to have 53 age-friendly communities across Greater Manchester, which Anna has, has helped us with and her team, uh, working with Paul McGarry, who I think is on the call, who leads uh, on uh, ageing better for, for Greater Manchester. We've, we've put a lot of work into this, and in those places now, we want to see this new form of public service delivery come through, place-based, the person at the heart of it, uh, really reforming how we support people day to day working with our with our voluntary sector. And then the third and last thing is social care. We, we are taking strides to integrate our, our system. And actually, there's a lot that Great Manchester Devolution has achieved. But I think we're at a moment here where we can really help the national debate. And what I will be doing, and I've already said this to the government, we'll be offering Greater Manchester as a as a pilot area to go much further, much faster on the full integration of health and social care, effectively creating one system with, with a foundation wage in social care and the same guaranteed standards around training, employment support, going right across the system, regardless of where people at work within it. A person-centered, preventative approach, uh, starting in the home, and in fact, taking the values of social care and in many ways, taking them into the NHS as opposed to a medical model taking over social care. That's the way that I see it. I think we're, we're in a great position now to be a formal uh, pilot for a reformed integrated single health and care system i'm going to be making that offer to the government uh, quite quite soon uh, and that's another way in which we can build back better i think we can build back better but the risk of what anna is saying of, of building back much worse and becoming much more divided is, is is huge and thank you to everyone who answered the poll because yes i think if we're going to achieve any of this we do need more resources if we're going to recover properly and indeed make Build Back Better a reality. Thank you for listening. I'll hand you back to Anna. Thanks very much, Andy. I think um, if I may just ask you one follow-up before I, before I come to Torsten. You talked there about the current response being London-centric. Um, you talked there about the need for more resources. What else do you need as a, a local leader uh, in terms of devolved power to deliver on those issues around public service uh, integration of health and social care and digital connectivity. Is there anything more than resource that you feel you need to be able to um, put in place those, those, those changes? Trust. Mm. We need central government to start trusting people at a local level. Not just give us the, the funding, but give it to us flexibly so that we can make decisions about how best uh, to deploy it. You know, this culture of making us bid to pots of funding for this and a bid for that, and it is wearying, really. I mean, and it suggests that they have to constantly tie us up um, in bureaucracy because they don't trust how local government will spend uh, funding. So uh, recovery will have to be led bottom up. It won't succeed. And what we've seen through this is national centralized, often privatized schemes just haven't worked. The testing, the PPE, contact mm -hmm. rates, it, it, they would have been much better building from the bottom up with us and asking us to take on more of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the burden through this. And so that's the, the best thing. And the way you could express that, Anna, would be flexible devolved funding so that we can respond in the way that we think is right for our, for our communities and, and 
move quickly because recovery will re require that you know an agility in decision making and that comes with 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 uh, trust and and fully devolved uh, funding and just to to, to to say i mean the london centric thing is not i know it can sound like an easy criticism to keep throwing but you know sadiq is rightly on cobra but why is only the mayor of london on cobra why you know this is a situation that is affecting all regions differently. All perspectives need to be heard in decision making. So maybe alongside trust, it's a simple plea for involvement in decision making, which I'm afraid hasn't hasn't been there throughout this. Thanks, Andy. That's great. So before we go to Torsten, another chance for you to give us your views. I'd like to ask you another polling question. Again, it will appear on the screen in a moment. And the question we would like to ask you is, do you think the world of work will change as a result of this crisis? And your options are yes, radically, yes, somewhat, no, not much, or don't know. So please vote now. Hopefully you've all had chance to respond to the poll. So if I can ask to see the results. So about 60% of you think that it will to some extent and as many as 35% think that there's gonna be some radical changes. Interestingly, only very, very few of you uh, don't think it'll change much at all. So thanks for that. I'd now like to invite Torsten to reflect on how the response so far will shape the economic recovery and look at some of the implications, particularly for older workers. So over to you, Torsten. Thanks, Anna, and um, thanks, Andy. It's good to hear a lot of that, and I agree with almost everything um, Andy's just said. And obviously, the book is worth reading, as Anna's plugging it as well, not least because it's a bit of positivity. A bit of positivity about ageing is good. A bit of positivity, just in general, is a good idea. Uh, right now lots of what I'm about to come on to is I'm afraid slightly less positive the um uh, so go and buy the book to perk yourself up again afterwards but on the the, the, the I'm going to focus on the labor market um there are obviously lots of other issues that are hugely important some of which we should come on to afterwards but on the labor market I think the key thing particularly amongst policy making circles where you know in general people that work in these kind of areas have not yet seen big redundancies uh, coming through and I can see that in our own when we do surveys of people that you know engage in resolution foundation things uh, in general people are working from home but they carry on doing their same jobs a few of them may be furloughed but I do think it's just really important to remind everybody how big the shock to the labour market that is going on for the population as a whole is right now it is it is of the like we have never seen it is by any order of magnitude bigger and faster than what we saw during the financial crisis which um, at the time, and definitely from the decade since, I've always said to myself, would be the defining economic shock of our lifetime. But here we are 10 years on, and we're seeing a labour market shock much bigger. We've seen the number of people on the claimant count measure going up by 850,000 in just six weeks. Again, nothing like we've ever seen before with over 2 million people now coming through on that measure. Now, what does that mean in terms of ageing? Well, uh, the way I would think about what's going on in the labour market right now is a U-shape. Uh, so if you think about the population as spread out by age, we're seeing the biggest effects are on the youngest workers, particularly those under 24, where we're seeing absolutely huge rates of job losses, furloughing and hours reductions. Uh, you then see less effect, although still, uh, you know, this is really awful for everyone. So then very significant, uh, but lower effects for the middle aged. Then there's got to be some effect. So some benefit to being middle-aged, given that you're the least happy people in the population in general. Um, uh, and then you've got a second uh, spike amongst older workers. So you've got a U-shape going on. We see that both in terms of who's lost their jobs and been furloughed. You can also see it in terms of who's had their, uh, who's earning less, even if they are still in work afterwards. So 35% of 18 to 25-year-olds are earning less than they did prior to the outbreak. And it's 30% for the uh, people in their early 60s. But those, that is just 23% for what's rather rather pejoratively called prime age workers. So 25 to 49 year olds. If you're within that bracket, well done. Uh, you count as prime for the purposes of this conversation. Um, so you've got this U shape going on. Now, in terms of how that uh, breaks down and what, how, what the lived experience of that is, so far, younger workers are the ones that are happiest being furloughed and actually the oldest workers are the least 
content about it. I mean, everyone's happy in general because they're having their wages paid and the alternative is unemployment. But amongst older workers, there is less enthusiasm for having been furloughed than there is amongst younger uh, workers. As I say, everyone is happy overall, but it's significantly happier amongst younger workers. Um, the next point to say is I think we should, there's too much out there talking as if there's going to be some kind of V-shaped recovery and this labour market can just bounce back to the world as it was beforehand. So maybe this U-shape will all go away. We haven't got any lasting problems. I think that is hugely complacent for a whole host of reasons. I don't want to go through all of them now. But the, the main thing to say is that the, the nature of the supply shock that is happening to our um, retail and our hospitality sectors in particular is you know, the hard version of that supply shock is we actually close them all. But even as we open, we're going to see that supply shock is going to last. So I'll give you an example. It's going to take more members of staff to deliver the same output uh, in sectors where we're queuing. Anyone that's tried to go to a, a council or other a refuse centre recently will have found they needed to book online in advance. There were people organising queues outside those refuse centres. All of this means less economic activity taking place. So the, the job losses that will remain in those sectors even when they're notionally open, think about pubs. Everyone's talking about allowing you to go into a pub garden. It's, it's completely, you know, it's far too optimistic to assume that the, the bounce back in jobs will be remotely as quick as some people are hoping. So assume, I would assume the U-shape will last. And then for older workers in particular, you know, in general, we say they're the ones lucky enough to have the wealth. Well, in this, and that is true. So you can see in terms of who's being able to draw down on savings to manage their way through this crisis, that is easier for older workers. The flip side of that, though, is that they're also the group seeing an income hit and probably a wealth shock happening at the same time. So assets in general are falling in value at the moment. Uh, you can see that in stock prices, which has a sh bigger short term effect on older people's pension pots. And you can equally see it on people's houses. So I think the income wealth double whammy being particularly uh, relevant for older workers, I think is worth us keeping in mind, obviously, that really matters how long this goes on for. Then just briefly, before I start to wrap up, so we can get on to the conversation. So there are some aspects of this that are particularly uh, hard for some older workers. I'm just going to go through um, four of them. So the first is, as we wind down the job retention scheme, which remember, the government has set out its intention to do from August through to October this year. And that, that is going to lead to a second wave of people flowing onto universal credit okay that and that, that is unavoidable to a degree but it's really serious and the pace it happens at really does uh, matter the challenge for older workers is that they because they tend to have more savings the ability of universal credit to cushion their um income shock is much lower because if you have anything if you have any significant savings your universal credit is means tested against that and so you won't receive the same replacement rate for your lost income as people without savings have now in general that's a reasonable approach but in a financial in a crisis where we're trying to compensate people for their lost income through no fault of their own it does pose a serious challenge for people that maybe had were holding some money in cash uh, ahead of retirement that is going to be a serious um, inhibition and their reliance on universal credit with that savings means test are, rather than the job retention scheme, which has none of that means testing in it, obviously, is a significant challenge. The second thing is that overall, if we look at how the housing part of this crisis is playing out, overall, it's definitely worse for uh, renters. So far, we're not seeing, this is not the 1990s recession. This is not going to be about mortgages losing their homes. Uh, housing costs are obviously much lower in general for older workers, but there still are 11% of people aged 50 to 64 renting in the private rented sector. And for those people, that is going to be a particularly big challenge for those of them that lose their uh, jobs. Abilities to manage rent um, is definitely where this is going to bite uh, hardest. The third point, I think, is that there is a danger that older workers get forgotten in, the in how we think about the recovery phase from this crisis, because there's, there's a number of reasons for that. One is um, because... Uh, the, because the rates of job losses are higher for young the young people. Two, it's because, uh, if I'm honest, the answers for young people are easier to imagine and have been more successful in the past. And so because we don't have the policy answers for the best ways to help, well, I don't have as well established consensus about what the policy answers are for older workers. My nervousness of you in conversations at the moment about how to focus on jobs in this recovery is that as a combination of, well, the num absolute numbers aren't as high, 
um, they were going to retire anyway, and the policy answers are hide, harder, leads us to just basically not do enough for older workers. And that is a serious problem that will affect people, their incomes in the here and now. But people do also need to save for their pensions in particular. They tend to do that in the last few years of their working lives, and that is a serious problem. The, then just to wrap up about the future, uh, and I'll, I'll focus again on the labour market, but look, in general, the future needs to be back to work support ramped up as we ramp down the job retention scheme. And we mustn't be doing that until we've got that back to work support uh, ready to go. Secondly, the health versus wealth debate, which can, in the wrong phrasing, get turned into an old versus young debate by some commentators at the moment, is massively overstated. Like the thing doing the wealth damage, i.e. the economic damage, is the health problem. And so the best thing to do is to solve both uh, together. The trade-off is nowhere near as acute as some people uh, say between the economics and the health side. On the macroeconomics, we are going to move in the hopefully, if everything goes well, soon from the phase of targeted support for those who have taken the biggest income hits towards needing general macroeconomic stimulus to start bringing jobs back into our recovery. That work needs to focus on the big things we know we need to do as a society anyway. Andy's listed some of them. Uh, that's about the climate transition, but it's also about the demographic transition. And so in terms of where that spend goes in the next year, focusing on the things we know we need to do anyway is the right thing to do. Then on working from home, and this, I mean, I'm afraid I'm in the slightly unfashionable view on the world of work, which is, in general, things don't tend to totally get be totally transformed by a crisis. What it tends to do is to accelerate trends that were already visible or at least latent prior to a crisis happening. So my view is the thing we should expect to see is more working from home by professionals uh, some days a week. So not a sudden, not the end of the office as everybody knows it, but just more days a week working from home. Uh, we, we, we went from 6 to 12% of the population doing that over the last 20 years. So seeing that trend accelerate is likely. My only word of warning is that if that trips into firms taking more aggressive action just to move everyone away, that does tend to work well for middle-aged people with kids. It is less good both for the young and the old in some circumstances. So if you look at surveys of who wants to work from home all the time or who thinks it should change after this crisis, the young are, the young are quite keen, although then get nervous about socialising and learning anything from work from the world of work. The old are by far the least keen. I don't know exactly why that is, but the reason Andy raises about digital literacy is probably very high up the list. And also, it's really important. To, lots of policymakers work in worlds where they can work from home and still earn their living. That is not true for large chunks of the population. And lots of low earners, older workers, they, you, you can't work in retail from home. Okay, So we need to be really careful about uh, that. And then briefly, things we should keep hold of, the way I think radical change is possible after this crisis. Social care, I'd say, is the big standout issue where it, this is for the reasons Andy outlined, which is the political kind of quagmire of it was hard to break the legacy, uh, the logjam on for lots of reasons over the last 20 years. There, you could see a binary change on that. And remember, 60% of our social care workforce are still paid less than the living wage today. So I think that is unsustainable. And the politics of that probably have been transformed. And then lastly, without sounding too much like a, a hippie, the level of community engagement in lots of places has been transformed. You'll all have seen it on your streets, WhatsApp groups, engagement, almost almost like more people offering to help to look after older people on the street and get their shopping than people actually want that shopping uh, done because they quite like to do something during the day. So that is, I think, is something that we both need to, but probably also can hang on to. So let's end on that positive. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Torsten. Some really great uh, food for thought. And I particularly like your strong point that we mustn't see health and wealth as this sort of binary trade-off, but uh, it's really critical to our future economic uh, recovery that we invest in, in the health of, of the population. There are so many issues that we've touched on and so many questions, and I'm really conscious that we have very little time. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions and I'll encourage Andy and Torsten to be brief so we can get through a few. And I don't know, Andy, whether your office will spare you for an extra five minutes or so. Uh, so we might just run slightly over the 11.45 um, uh, deadline. So we've heard that, Torsten, you talked about it. The communities have really mobilized. And I've got a question here from Anya from uh, Hackney CBS. And um, she's really asking, how can we build this kind of community collective, bottom-up, hyper-local response into public service delivery in future? 
So perhaps Andy, you might start with that one. Thanks, Anna. I can say probably till 12. I don't know if you want to, you know, if, if you wanted to run it on a little longer. Austin, um, we'll just negotiate on screen. <laughs> It would be absolutely fantastic if we can go to just before sure. 12 because there's so much to debate and I would really love you guys to have a chance to answer people's questions. So sure. That, yeah. No problem. So I'll try to answer the question directly and quickly. Um, it's what I was describing about a place based approach. That's what we're trying to build in Greater Manchester. Start hyper local and, and have all public services working as essentially as one team in the locality. Um, it's called, we put out a white paper on it. So if you're interested, it's the Greater Manchester model, unified public services that builds from place. Get rid of the silos, that, that's the way to go. But, but there's a key point to, to mention, and I think it comes up in someone else's question about trust. I was talking national to local government. Someone's raised a point about trust from statutory organizations to the voluntary sector. And that's work in progress in Greater Manchester, but still not where it needs to be. I think if you, to create a really hyper-local approach, I think you've got to have a different relationship with the voluntary sector and put it on long-term core funding to provide services linked to social prescribing, uh, all of the things that you would want to see in, in, in a new model of community support. So, yeah, I think, you know, th those are the things that I would pluck out. You know, you need to go to a model of integrated public service working, not just health and social care, by the way, I'm talking, you know, all public services uh, in that model. And then secondly, a new relationship of trust um, between statutory and voluntary sector. Torsten, you uh, touched there on the different experience that older workers maybe have around issues like universal credit, employment support, um, and so on. There was a question came in, however, about recruitment and uh, ageism in the recruitment process, which obviously is nothing new, but obviously, as we're going to see larger numbers of people seeking employment, do you think that over 50s, over 60s are going to suffer more when trying to get employment? Or do you think that employers are going to see the experience of older workers as a, in a more positive way? That's from Steve Cooper. Um, so, so history definitely tells us that uh, older workers, younger workers and workers from minority groups. So that, and it's really important to remember a lot. It's not it won't just be the health effects of this crisis that are felt most heavily by BME groups. We're also likely to see the labour market effect being longest lasting for those groups. Now, there's been progress in that area, although not for black workers over the last 20 years, but for other groups there has been. Um, so I think we should expect some of that to go backwards and to need to be focused on. But yes, broadly, for all, the groups that are furthest from the labour market and tend to have the lowest employment rates also tend to be the ones that see the um, that go to the back of the queue for job hiring afterwards. Um, now, there are things we can do about that, and it is really important, for example, that our back to work programs, when they properly get up and running, don't like I'm not I don't support programs that, for example, you see people saying we should have specific programs just for those who are on the job retention screen flowing off, because what that will do is to prioritize those workers who are relatively I say relatively because it's bad for everyone, privileged, i.e. they had that support for a while against those who have actually been out of work and will have been out of work for some considerable period of time by uh, the time we get to the autumn. So I think we need to focus on people who are out of work for a considerable period of time for the most intensive uh, support. But also remember, if we don't get the macroeconomics of this right, you can't fix it with the micro. So like getting a back to work support right will only work if we've got the timing of withdrawing some support and introducing other support on the macroeconomic side, right, so that we don't have as big a, a dole queue in the first place. I think that, that, I mean, if you just think about, you know, what, what, are the, what are the early half of the 2020s now going to be about? That this is not what anyone expected to be doing three months ago, but our job is to get employment. You know, we thought we'd been living with record employment for the last five years. We've got complacent. The task for this five years is to deal with very high unemployment rates. Andy, you heard there from Torsten as well about the eco economic and employment impacts of, of the crisis. Is there anything that, you know, you're thinking about uh, in Greater Manchester about how you can work with employers and employment support to really ensure that the impacts are not, you know, um, felt too hard by, by older workers? Three, Anna. Um, Torsten rightly says that it's going to be younger people hardest hit. Um, you know, we, we do have to recognise that even in, in this event today, it is going to be the younger generation. So we're looking at a young uh, person's guarantee 
I think Liverpool are doing the same. So that's a, a guarantee of something in the autumn. Apprenticeship, study, you know, work shadowing, whatever it is, but every young person with something to, 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 to go to. Second thing, thinking more up the age range, we, we have control of the adult education budget in Greater Manchester now. And increasingly we're looking to uh, focus it on what we call conversion courses. So give people the ability to, to take, take a sidestep from an industry where employment prospects might not be great. You know, as Torsten's saying, you know, some of the jobs that people have where terms and conditions and the standards, not, not great. And then take a sidestep into an industry where there's much more potential for growth. So you know, green construction is an obvious example people will give. Digital as well, you know, there's huge opportunities there. And possibly public service reform. You know, the, the thing that I was talking about before, you know, building a new model could mean new roles within, within health um, uh, and uh, support in the, in the community. So conversion courses is something that we're, 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 we're looking at uh, to help people, um, you know, to, to, to move into a growing, more future looking part of the economy. And then lastly, just to say, thinking about all employment standards, we have got something called the Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter, which is a comprehensive um, document that covers, you know, all the kind of facets of work, uh, not just pay and, and security of contracts, but much more in flexibility. And there's an opportunity here, by the way, isn't there? Do we, the, the question asking people, will work change? It's interesting that the vast majority of people think it will. And it could change the better, couldn't it? More homeworking, flexible start time, um, to, so people can balance caring responsibilities and, and work. I think there's a real opportunity for people who are older carers uh, within all, all of that, and that mustn't be missed. So, but we've got a vehicle that could actually really entrench it. Um, and you know, increasingly we're thinking, could we link all public procurement in Greater Manchester to the Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter? Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean that you don't get a contract. That, if you're not a good employer, what it means is you, there'll be a weighting applied if you are a Greater Manchester Good Employer. And I know that Liverpool are, are bringing forward an almost identical charter. Um, and you know, this is something that could build out, if you like, through the devolved, devolved areas. And I think we do need to get much more, if we're to address the issues Torsten's raising, mm. the scale of the redundancies that we might face, the, 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 the huge challenge of getting people back into work. I think pr public procurement is an issue that, needs to come center stage you know we really need to um start thinking differently about how we use public money to both improve jobs but create them as well so you've both mentioned digital and obviously we've seen whether you've got you know access and confident to use digital as a key factor in how you've fared during the lockdown um and so those who are digitally excluded have been particularly hard hit whether it's come you know, food shopping or keeping in touch with people and social activities. Um, you've also mentioned it in the context of uh, work. So how do we ensure those who are digitally excluded still have access? The question here from Philip from Rochdale Borough Wide Housing is specific to access to social opportunities and activities to increase well-being and decrease isolation. But you might want to address more generally, how do we ensure those who are digitally excluded have access full stop? Who'd like to take that first? Torsten, do you want to? Uh, I, I don't have loads of interest. I, I, you know, some of this is blindingly obvious, which is hardware, um, uh, where actually it isn't as simple as, you know, clearly some of it is, ob is obvious, which is there are areas, there are isolated areas of the country where it's not economic to roll out broadband and the state needs to make sure it happens at anything like a decent uh, pace but you can see even places in some of our big cities where there's seriously deficient um, uh, broadband rollout for a range of um, reasons so I don't have anything interesting to say on that apart from we should get on with dealing with that and going back to what I was saying earlier when you're thinking about where you spend your money and your macroeconomic stimulus of the next uh, year then thinking about the areas where we're going to have to spend money anyway is a good place to start and that includes one of those on i mean on digital skills for the older population uh, just to be a bit more positive so your experience of the last two and a half months definitely has been shaped by your level of your skills but we are also seeing an upskilling if, to be honest like adversity has forced a level of upskilling amongst but to be blunt some aspects of our older population 
uh, where the, the fact that you, you know, is a suddenly very strong incentive to engage with online shopping, and some people have been doing that. The, um, but clearly, there's a big, you know, distributional uh, split there about who does and who doesn't. But I would say, you know, overall, probably the last, the experience of the last two months has probably seen more digital inclusion than all of the small kind of micro targeted education programs funded by people, companies, CSR programs over the last uh, 20 years. So there is a silver lining going on. Andy, do you want to add to that? I agree with everything uh, Torsten uh, just said. I mean, I think the, um, the issue is, as I was saying before, we've got to move the great work that goes on with digital skills um, in communities, which is, is there. It needs to become much more comprehensive, I think. And you know, we need to actively work to get older people online. I know someone said in the chat, you know, maybe they don't want to, but I think it's, it's kind of more than that. It's got to be really active encouragement to do it because life is happening somewhere else and they're not the isolation and the loneliness that will come from not being connected is going to be huge and we've got to be a bit more a bit more muscular let's say in our kind of like you know you you kind of need to get on I can't be the only person who's had a painful three or four goes at a zoom call with my mum and dad uh, trying to get them into the family quiz I mean it is it, it's kind of been a bit tricky but um you can get there you know and, and uh, you know once you're there it's like swimming isn't it? once you're swimming you're fine aren't you it's just like that painful bit <laughs> to start to start off with but um i think it, i just think we've got to get much more serious about it work with the tech companies to provide hardware so we've been doing that for um disadvantaged teenagers throughout this so we've been providing um sort of tech packs um tablets you know co you know and data packages so we need to think of that at the other end of the age range as well you know if social prescribing is to work it's a much more efficient way of delivering it if you're going to kind of create a whole load of online uh, support and tools via social prescribing and that will mean you know where people can't afford it finding a way working with industry to you know, either subsidize it or whatever get people online get people using it you know otherwise the, the issues that you've raised Anna around loneliness and isolation they they will they will get much worse uh, mm -hmm. the more that people are kind of moving uh, the way they work into the online space we've taken a huge leap into this space in this in a short space of months and I think it's it's not letting everyone leap, kind of run away and leave an even more excluded group. So hope that uh, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of other issues we haven't touched on. If we can just try and 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 pick them up, I'd like to. I mentioned in my opening about housing during lockdown. We've all been stuck in our homes, and it's really shone a light on some of the inadequacy of our current housing stock. So. What can we learn from COVID-19 about the importance of the quality of our homes and what action do we need to take to improve both the existing stock and to um, build new houses better? And that's from Sue Adams, Care and Repair England. So perhaps Andy, you wanna kick that one off? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think we need to think differently about the home, don't we? Stay at home, um, work from home. Whatever. We've all been focusing on the home. Obviously that exposes again, a real, difficulty because some people simply can't um they haven't got the space the environment doesn't support good health um I, i've been doing a lot of work on homelessness so i don't know if people know that but i've been going to finland uh, to see what they do and they've got something there called housing first which i thought was originally a kind of homelessness pro specific project where people get homes and an add-on support and it is that but actually what i discovered when i went there is that housing first is a national philosophy mm -hmm. basically saying simply if you don't have good housing you don't have anything you don't have good health uh good work good prospects housing is the bedrock for everything and i think we should be frankly ashamed in this country that around 40 percent of homes in the private rented sector are beneath the decent home standard so quite clearly a lot of people don't have homes that can support good health and that would be very true of of older uh, people so i i think three quick things we we do need to regulate the private rented sector alongside our good employment charter we're bringing through a good landlord charter it's not acceptable that any landlord should receive public money through benefits and not maintain their home to the decent standard i mean that is just for me that is a, a given <clears throat> and we should do that immediately but have a tougher regulatory regime secondly how can we improve people's homes one of the ways we might create jobs through this is to accelerate retrofitting of homes to make them zero carbon and the good thing about that of course is it can lower people's um, uh, energy bills 
So I am actively looking at, at that. You know, I, I'm told it could create a workforce of thousands across Greater Manchester. If, and we're going to have to do it anyway if we're going to be zero carbon as a country. So let's get on and do that, <clears throat> do that now, improve people's, have a home improvement program coming out of this. Uh, I think is a really good thing to do. And then lastly, I think because of the nature of Greater Manchester devolution and the priorities that we've got for industrial development in green uh, industries and construction, in digital and in health innovation, I think we need to start thinking of the new modular home that is zero carbon and dig digitally enabled to support independent living. You would need to bring these industries together that are a little bit separate at the moment. Digital's over there, green's over there, housing definitely somewhere else, and then health provision. You know, you've got to get them into one place where we think of the home um, as a place uh, that can support people in so many ways. Um, and I just think you know that's a project that really needs to, to come yeah. forward. You know, people talk of passive house um, uh, technology, and I've seen it. Yeah, it's fantastic, and you know that 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 is the starting point maybe modular zero carbon but then add in that assisted living part of it as well through more digital technology Absolutely. so i was just going to put you on the spot there right. and say at center for aging better we're trying to say that the future home and any massive investment in retrofit for carbon zero should also make that home future proofed in terms of accessibility and adaptability so i hope that's that in, we'll in that. Year, we can bring those two agendas we will take that on board together. anna that's the book is already making change happen <laughs> Um, so, Torsten, you talked about the decline of retail. Um, obviously, high streets across the country are already full of empty units, and I'm anticipating that uh, will, this will only further accelerate the decline of the high street. Uh, Julie from Move It or Lose It says these could be used to bring people together to socialise, exercise, learn, volunteer, access services. And uh, she wonders, how do you think that the government, maybe through things like the Towns Fund or the High Street Fund could work with the real estate sector to um, create a, a different, I suppose, version of our of our town centres and high streets. Yep, I think that's a huge that's a huge policy challenge we had anyway. And the thing that this crisis has done is to take the, insofar as we had time on our side, it's taken it away. So the retail sector has been declining, actually, long before Amazon got going. It's been declining basically since two thousand and two. 2003. Some of that is to do with the speed of the recent decline is online uh, driven, but it's also being driven by uh, longer term trends about what we choose to spend our money on. We buy less things and we do more uh, doing. Um, so we're all responsible. So that and so the key thing is about the way in which place is managed to actually make that adjustment. Um, and the hard thing is that if this crisis, so basically it will shake out the bits of retail that were probably going to disappear anyway over the next five years and speed that process up. You're seeing that already with the likes of um, actually not just retail, bits of hospitality as well. Carluccio's you've seen, you've seen uh, Bright House for other reasons as well, disappear off lots of high streets. And you'll be seeing that in lots of our department stores coming under pressure um, as well. I think the loss of time is a real problem because basically successful city centres and town centres need to move away from retail over time and towards uh, leisure, hospitality and office space. That is basically what a successful transition looks like to this big economic shift. You can't make it, you cannot make this economic shift go away. It is like here to stay. I, I'm, I'm nervous about people saying, oh, I've turned this individual unit into a kind of nice social space as that is a good thing to do, but that has to be done. You've got to have a plan for the whole city center and town center, because unless that place is a nice place to both work and visit, then its long-term future is stuffed. Okay. I think that, so we've got to be really hard headed about what it will need to do to make people succeed on that transition. You didn't mention residential, so I'm going to do the same as I did to well. Andy. Um, you know, we're lobbying to get changes to the permitted developments. It's rather technical, but at the moment, if you convert <clears throat> retail to residential, you don't have to meet any uh, quality standards at all. Yeah. And yet there's a huge opportunity to build some accessible, adaptable, right-sized properties, uh, you know, in, in a thriving uh, town centre. So um, hopefully, yes, we can revision and uh, um, do something, as you say, that's a plan rather than just um, converting individual units. So thanks, thanks for those comments, Torsten. So final, very quick fire question to you before we close. Are you an optimist or pessimist? Do you think we can create the age of aging better as we set out on the road to recovery? Andy. Uh, 
always the, always the optimist you've got, you've got to be when you support Everton and uh, and the Labour Party you, you learn if you didn't you'd you'd have given up long long ago so I'm always um, always an optimist I think it's interesting you know the the poll at the start said everyone thinks life's going to change so every, I think everyone feels that and it's going to be really important that we try and set a vision of how it could change for the better because otherwise people are going to become despondent and you know it's going to be really you know, the 2020s in the north could be as bad as the 1980s if we're not if we're not careful mm -hmm. <clears throat> so i think it's it's going to be a tough road for people no no question as torsten has said mm -hmm. but by kind of painting a vision of how it even though it's tough now it could be to a better outcome in five years that's going to be really really important and i think we can maybe not everything but some things can definitely be accelerated through this right. and can, can change the better I just saw, just very quickly, if I might, um, Anna, Tony in the chat was querying about GM devolution on health and social care, and is it is it progressing? Is it achieving anything? It is in truth. I mean, it's there's a lot of things I could say about how the health service has been supporting social care over recent years. Integration is a reality. It's it's happening. It's just that in the last few years, social care has been underfunded, and you know, the, the funding hasn't worked. So we've been patching up rather than actually putting forward a really positive vision for what it really could look like if you put proper funding into the system. So I think GM's laid the foundations is the way I'd describe it, Tony. But, but now it's ready for someone to come in and say, right, let's really take this to the next level. And that's what I was trying to say in, in making the, the offer of a pilot. I apologise, we haven't really got had time to touch on care. Perhaps we can invite you back, Andy, at another Yes, yeah, it's, it's been brilliant, Anna. I've really enjoyed it. It's great to hear Thorsten <laughs> yeah. as well. Um, thank you, everybody, for yeah. your questions. Yeah. Torsten, do you want to answer the question? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? I'm going now. Thanks, Anna. Okay, bye, Andy. Thank you very much. I think we're all. I think we're all done. So I, I, I might I, let you um, uh, uh, take the time to answer another time. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you to our speakers, Andy Burnham and Torsten Bell. This is the first in a webinar series on the road to recovery. Other themes will include housing, work, communities, health, and digital. We hope that you'll join us for those. And don't forget the recording will be up on our YouTube channel. So thank you everyone for joining and have a good day. Bye.